The killing of George Floyd has sparked nationwide protests demanding an end to police brutality and a restructuring of police departments across the country. Taking over boulevards, freeways and bridges, the call for change in the name of George Floyd, George Floyd! is now being realized in communities across the nation. That change is being manifested in calls to reform, defund, dismantle or abolish the police. The movement to defund the police seems to have gained the most support from thought leaders and policymakers across the nation. I want to make a statement of principle right now that based on the suggestions of the caucus, based on the work of the task force, that we will be moving funding from the NYPD to youth initiatives and social services. Since 2007, the United States has collectively spent over $100 billion on policing annually. That number has increased dramatically in the past 35 years. In 1980, police spending was just around $47 billion adjusted for inflation. But by 2015, spending skyrocketed to almost $143 billion, an increase of over 200%. Meanwhile, crime rates have gone down. People are recognizing that budgets oftentimes are related to power. The more economic resources you have, the more power you have, the more leeway you have. And in law enforcement, one of the things that we see is that the larger their budgets get, that hasn't necessarily correlated with a reduction in crime. What we've been seeing for the last 20, 30 years is a consistent decline in violent and property crime in the United States. But an increase in investment in corrections, the judicial system, and particularly in policing. So where does this money come from? And why is there a movement to defund the police? Despite a sharp decline in crime rates since the early 1990s, the United States is spending more on policing than ever. According to the most recent finalized data, the U.S. government collectively spent $143 billion on policing in 2015. The history of uh, police funding, they typically get what they ask for. Um, I think that uh, particularly in, in cities that have unionized police departments, local politicians do not want to run the risk of incurring the wrath of police unions and so are often um, compelled, coerced, maybe even in some cir circumstances intimidated into giving the cops what they want. It's unusual for the police to fail to receive um, financing for uh, projects that they want to undertake or equipment that they want to acquire. All three levels of government, federal, state, and local, contribute to the cost of police protection, but their contributions are far from equal. With most law enforcement occurring at a local level, local governments pay the bulk of police spending. Across the U.S., the cost of policing accounted for roughly a dollar of every $10 spent by counties, municipalities, and townships compared to a dollar of every $100 spent by states. A majority of that money comes from taxpayer dollars, accounting for 42% of local government revenue in 2017, and nearly half of state government revenue. So I was on the Boston Police Department for my career in law enforcement, and I continue to live in the city. It's a city of about 650,000 population. Uh, the police department is about 2,000 sworn officers. Uh, the budget that the police department operates on is largely taxpayer funded from municipal property taxes and it's approaching a half a billion dollars. It's about $460 million a year to run the Boston Police Department. In 2015, local governments paid for more than two thirds of police spending. Federal governments came second at 20.4%, followed by state governments at 11%. The funds are also allocated differently as well. State funding typically goes to support highway patrols while local governments pay for the sheriff's office and local police departments. Out of the three levels of government, federal spending has seen the fastest rate of growth. Between 1982 and 2015, federal spending grew by 354%, faster than both local and state spendings combined. The federal government has its own plethora of police forces that you know people are familiar with between the U.S. Marshals and FBI and Homeland Security, but they also have a number of grant programs that are pushing money to the state and local level. Even departments that are seemingly unrelated to law enforcement, like the Department of Agriculture, provides grants for rural areas to spend on policing. 
After 9-11, Congress also authorized the Department of Homeland Security to provide grants that can help local communities to better prepare against the threat of terrorism, also known as preparedness grants. These programs provide almost $1.8 billion to local communities, but at least 25% of the majority of grants are required to be spent on local law enforcement's efforts to fight terrorism. Most federal spending comes from two major grants from the Department of Justice, COPS and Burn Jack. The Community Oriented Policing Services, or COPS, was enacted by President Clinton in 1994 to combat the rise in violent crime at the time. Although its funding has dramatically decreased over the years, it still funneled $304 million in 2019 to state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies. That COPS initiative put 100,000 police officers on the streets in the 90s, right? And that program still exists. It exists in the concept of, you know, funneling some federal money down for hiring local law enforcement, for training and technical assistance, and really sort of pushing the concept of community policing uh, from the federal level to local jurisdictions. The Burn Justice Assistance Grants, known as Burn Jack, was started as a part of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988 and consolidated in 2005 with a program that honored an officer who died in the line of duty. Although the program was designed to award funding to a wide variety of initiatives, more than half are awarded to support law enforcement across the country. The funding from Burn Jack still averages at around $435 million each year. Whether federal funding for law enforcement actually benefits the community has long been a subject of debate. The Congressional Research Service concluded that based on three separate studies, COPS grants showed no universal effect on crime rates. Some studies even suggest that the grant might not have been effective in cities with more than 250,000 people. In 2006, the Bush administration sought to eliminate all Burn Jack funding due to a lack of demonstrable results, but it was eventually reauthorized through 2012. Researchers also argue that federal government funds are the reason behind the larger and more militarized police forces we see today. Police spending differs widely depending on the state. Kentucky, for instance, spent only $186 per capita on police protection in 2017, while states like New York spent as much as $529. For bigger cities like Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York City, police spending can be over a billion, and for many, take up more than a quarter of the city's fund expenditures, according to research from the Center for Popular Democracy. The vast majority of uh, law enforcement agencies are the sort of local city or municipality law enforcement agencies that are uh, oftentimes serving communities of less than 10,000 people. And in these jurisdictions, the bulk of you know county or city government spending tends to be on police. There's also a striking disparity within the city budget. In cities like Oakland, California, police department spending accounted for 41.2% of the city's general fund budget, compared to 1.1% for human services, funding youth programs and income supports, and 0.5% for public works. These numbers fuel a movement to defund the police. The idea is to reduce the spending on the police department and redirect them to social services and community projects. Defunding is not abolishing the police. It simply means taking a market-driven approach to general funds to figure out where funding should be placed in a municipality. And that might vary across the board. There are some places that might need more resources in law enforcement and others might need less. Others might need more in social services or education. And I think part of the reallocation perspective is saying that we don't simply have a one size fit all, but instead we say, based on what's happening here, this is how funding should be allocated. Advocates make the point that investing in communities and providing them with the right resources will better serve its citizens. We know the biggest drivers to contact with the justice system are poor educational attainment, poor workforce opportunities, you know, people who are lower income and people who live in communities of color, right? We, these are things we've known and we've studied as criminologists for years, right? But in terms of investments, in communities of color, investments in education, investments in healthcare, investments in substance abuse treatment in the community outside of the justice system, those are things that we still to this day have a really hard time spending increasing volumes of taxpayer money on. On the flip side though, we appear not to have a hard time spending money on the reactionary policies, on the police, and on prison and jail systems. Those on the side of law enforcement argue that defunding the police will only result in a higher crime rate. 
Defunding is a nice catchphrase, but in reality, you're defunding police organizations that for the most part are already significantly underfunded. And that's going to be made worse because of the coronavirus economic impact that all states and cities are beginning to feel. We have to find common ground. But I strongly oppose the radical and dangerous efforts to defend, dismantle, and dissolve our police departments, especially now when we've achieved the lowest recorded crime rates in recent history. Americans know the truth. Without police, there is chaos. Without law, there is anarchy. And without safety, there is catastrophe. Several cities have already taken measures to make defunding the police a reality. The LA Police Commission president announced a $100 to $150 million cut to the LAPD budget was under consideration. Only time and more research will determine whether defunding the police will create safer communities. One thing that is for sure, the movement is leading to critical conversations at the local level on how to best protect citizens. When it comes to funding police departments, I think that this whole notion of defund the police is a, an important conversation that's happening. I think that we really need to think as a country about where we're investing local, state, and federal dollars and how we're making uh, the most use of that money to positively impact communities. 